Welcome to Inspiring STEM's podcast program highlighting innovations in scientific publishing and science communications. We are interviewing key opinion leaders and organizations from around the world who are working to advance and quite often to disrupt the status quo. My name is Martin Delahanty and I will be your host. My guest for this episode is Kylie Walker, Chief Executive Officer for the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, where she works with expert fellows to lead crucial national conversations and strategies towards a thriving, healthy and connected Australia supported by technology. Kylie is also a visiting fellow at the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. She was chair of the Australian National Commission for UNESCO. And in 2019, she was named as one of the t top 100 women of influence listed by the Australian Financial Review for her work on improving equity, diversity and inclusion in STEM. A very warm welcome, Kylie, to the programme. Real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Before we get into your current work, uh, perhaps you can share a little bit about your, your background and what you what led you to your passion for science communications and the career that you have now? Sure. So I started out my working life as a journalist and I, I was inspired to follow that profession because I, um, I believe very strongly in the importance of telling truth to power um, in a healthy and functioning democracy. So that was always um, the only place that I ever saw myself going, to be honest. But while I was a journalist, um, I became more and more interested in science and technology sort of via the route of medicine. Um, I, I was the national medical correspondent for Australian Associated Press. And um, I, I routinely came across uh, really, really interesting stories in science and technology that were not quite within my remit as a medical correspondent. Mm -hmm. So being able to uh, ask editors and uh, and prosecute the case for having science in the media, um, mm -hmm. it, it, I became more and more passionate about it because it was it was actually quite challenging. It mm -hmm. was um, it was becoming more and more clear to me the more senior I became um, and the more experienced I became as a journalist that um, that the editors that I was working with at least, and, and from what I could see across the media landscape, weren't actually terribly interested. And, and this only spurred me mm -hmm. to, to further uh, action. Um, I was very, very keen that um, that people had, that the general public, the non-expert audience, mm -hmm. um, had a good understanding of how science and technology contributes to our lives. And as you know, they do in every day in many, many ways. Um, so when I left journalism, I, I actually went into uh, science and technology advocacy and communications, and that's where I've been uh, for a, a couple of decades now. It's, um, it, it's really a very deep and abiding passion for me, and I do see that really strong connection in terms of speaking mm -hmm. truth, because a lot of the work that I do is about helping people understand the facts, the possibilities, um, the, the work that's been done in research and its application and what that means for our everyday lives, but also the awe and the mm. excitement and the, the optimism that that work can Absolutely. bring because it really does. Every time uh, a new breakthrough is made, every time a new application is achieved, um, it does advance us in some way or it has the potential to at least. Um, so I'm passionate about helping people understand just how exciting and how important um, they, this work is to everybody in our everyday lives. That's great. And I, 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 love, I love your motto, truth to power. That's, that's fantastic. And that, that also that passion comes across you know, very, very, very nicely. Um, so although your, 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 your qualifications weren't in, in science, obviously you've uh, so embraced science. You said, you know, as a as a child, you were fascinated about science, and uh, um, yeah. And I think, um, particularly the first roles that I had in science communication and advocacy, um, what struck me really clearly is that as a communication expert, um, I guess a, a connector, a translator, an amplifier, um, I was playing a really important role. Um, I think it's a, an incredibly important profession, science communication. Mm -hmm. We have um, highly skilled and very focused researchers uh, and the people who work to apply that research as well. Um, and 
I think often we can get a little bit tangled up in expecting um, them to be everything to everybody. Um, but And some are going to be skilled at that and some are going to be passionate about doing that and really enjoy doing that, and that's sure. excellent and we should support and, mm. and, and uh, encourage that. But there are also going to be, I think, a, a great number of people who are very, very clever people doing very important work who are not actually skilled or, um, or interested in, um, mm. in science communication doesn't mean that their work isn't worth communicating, and so that's where science communicators come in. Um, and I see a real, um, a, a, a really uh, beautiful kind of relationship of equals there between skilled science communicators and skilled scientists and technologists, um, because, uh, yes, it's important. It's not enough to say, I've done the work. It's published in a journal, um, mm -hmm. therefore everyone needs yes. to know about it, pay heed to mm -hmm. it, apply it in their policy uh, making or their um, their decision making or um, mm -hmm. or their um, I guess their engineering and their building, it isn't enough to do that because of course that's not how the world works and particularly now in the information age there's just such a deluge of information a lot of it's rubbish um, and it requires yes. an extraordinary uh, amount of time skill and uh, and commitment to be able to sift through that and find the bits mm. that are relevant to the work that we're doing, the decisions we're making, whether that's as a parent or as a teacher, as an individual, perhaps as a carer for, for um, an elderly relative, mm. or whether it's as the leader of, uh, of a business or uh, mm. a nation. Yes. Finding those nuggets of gold, that evidence, that relevant current evidence that, it, that I think is essential to inform us to make good decisions that really do advance our, our own lives and society, that's difficult. So there is a really strong need, I think, for people who are able to, who are across um, that work to some extent, who are able to sift through, distill that important research and then mm. communicate it in a way that's accessible for a general public. Mm. These skills aren't necessarily the same skills that you need for research. Yes. Um, so that became a real focus for me and, and remains so. But the flip side for me, the, the selfish part of it for me is that um, it means that I get to talk to really, really clever people and really <laughs> interesting yeah. things. Um, yes. And that really, um, that, that gives me joy. That's great. And, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're all concerned about fake news and fake, fake, fake scientific news and having the skills and capability through, you know, the expertise of science communicators to curate that information and to translate it and to, you know, again, uh, take an evidence-based approach is so, so important. And, you know, particularly after COVID, I think we're all, you know, exposed to the public. We're exposed to, you know, deluges of fake news around science or science that was badly communicated. So, you know, the, the need for science communications is is mm -hmm. even greater now, but of course it, it's always been that case. Yeah, and I think you see it, it, it yes, absolutely on a personal level because you know um, if if you're truly informed and you have the evidence, you, just sort of building on what you're saying about the pandemic, mm. then you know of course you're wearing um, an appropriate mask. Of course you're getting the immunisation when it's available. Of course you're getting the boosters and encouraging vulnerable people in your life to do that. Um, but on a on a societal level, on a, um, a governance sort of national governance level, it's it's doubly important because the decisions that are being made by um, political decision makers in, during mm. a pandemic as it in, unfolds have real life or death consequences for not just one or two people, but for many many people. Um, and uh, I was. Um, I guess really sort of quite comforted that during the pandemic here in Australia, as I, I think also happened in the UK, um, mm -hmm. the government very proactively called on the learned academies um, and our networks of experts to be able to um, provide independent, late, like best latest available inf information based on evidence and research in order to inform their decision making. So we had a, a function set up here in Australia with the five learned academies, mm -hmm. um, of which um, my academy is one, whereby um, cabinet ministers would uh, put out a, a question um, on, a, on a piece of um, research or evidence. And they were, they were things like, um, how long will the virus last? Uh, how long will it live on various surfaces? 
Mm. Um, tell us about the, um, the major pros and cons, challenges and opportunities for the various kinds of vaccines that were being developed. Mm. But there were also um, much more uh, pragmatic questions, I guess, in terms of uh, how quickly can we switch this kind of manufacturing to be able to make it become a, a, a PPE factory? Or, um, you know, what, how long, uh, how far can we, uh, can we ship the viruses? Oh, sorry, the viruses. How far can we mm. ship the, um, the vaccines in what conditions yes. and what do we need to, to do in order to make that work? But also things like workforce. So what, what um, effect can we expect the pandemic to have on, um, on the research workforce? So those kinds of questions were coming to the Learned Academies and through our networks where we're able to um, gather the, the evidence and the best um, available expertise very, very quickly um, into very short uh, very focused but incredibly robust papers. Um, this would be, uh, we're talking about maybe 10 days turnaround for, for mm. a paper mm. of, of this nature. That if mm. you had your time, you'd probably do sort of in six or eight months. Um, very mm. densely packed, very high quality information. And they were, they were absolutely using that information as, um, as a basis for decision making. And that's really, a key function. It's really central to the mission of the Learned Academy and, and obviously to our Learned Academy in particular, that ability to provide that, um, that evidence-based advice to the places that matter at the times that matter. Um, that's really central to what we do. Mm. Uh, I think the, the great thing also in, in, in chatting with you, Carly, is that, um, yeah, I think there should, should be and is great interest in Australia is uh, science communications capabilities, which I think are outstanding from you know, my brief experience in working with uh, university institutions in Australia. And we, we had uh, Carly Ahern last year on our podcast, sort of elaborating on, you know, the, uh, the impact of Australian science communications and, you know, how that works for various institutions. So you, you, you specialize in connecting technologists, engineers, and scientists with, with governments, business, media, society, and these skills you've built up, you know, over many years in senior federal communication advocacy roles uh, across science and technology and health sex sectors. So in your current role, could you share some insights into priorities and, and how you work? Mm. Well, I've talked a little bit about how we work in terms of that evidence-based um, advice um, to decision makers, but I guess the key priorities for our academy and, and for me personally um, are the same key priorities for all of the learned academies of technology and engineering around the world, um, and they are climate change and workforce. Um, and, and we know that um, both of these are intrinsically linked and, and addressing uh, mitigating and, and adapting to climate change is not going to be possible um, until and unless we have um, the skilled workforce that's required to, to be mm. able to not just um, invent but also apply roll out um, and build the infrastructure for the solutions um, that are urgently required. I say that it, it's uh, these are priorities for, for the learned academies around the world because actually um, just a few months ago I was able to attend the annual meeting of the Council of Academies of Engineering and Technological Science, uh, Sciences and there are 32 of those um, internationally um, members of the mm -hmm. Council. Um, and when we started talking about what our priorities were, it became clear immediately that, that these are common. Climate change is the number one priority for humanity. Clearly, yes. it's an existential threat. Mm. If we don't get this right, then nothing else will matter. I'm not sure of the workforce statistics around, uh, around the world, but in Australia, we have a, a shortfall of 60,000 engineers currently. Mm. And the projections are dire. That's growing exponentially. Um, and not only is the gap in the workforce growing, but the need, the, the demand for those sorts of skills is growing at the same time. So um, it's given that this is happening globally, um, we cannot rely, as we have, as a, as a small nation, we have always relied on skilled migration. Um, and that absolutely has a part to play in addressing this workforce shortage, but clearly it can't be the only solution because this shortage is occurring all around the world. So we do have to get a lot smarter and a lot more quickly at bringing in many more people to 
science, engineering and technology. Um, and to think, mm. uh, I think, a little bit more creatively about the kinds of people that we bring in um, and skill up and deploy into the workforce. And, and by STEM workforce, I'm not just talking about research. I, I you know, at, at the Academy and, and me personally, we take a, a very broad perspective of what, what it looks like or how you define yourself as a STEM professional. Um, yes. You know, I, I'm including people who are in charge of infrastructure or who are running airlines, for example, um, people who apply STEM skills in their professional life are equally a STEM professional as a, as a researcher. And this is where the greatest gap is, um, is mm. occurring, of course, particularly for engineers. So we're working um, both from a programmatic perspective, but also from an advocacy perspective um, with other um, leaders in the sector and, and politically in Australia to uh, think, yes, as I said, very creatively about who we um, attract and skill and retrain, uh, re retrain and retain in STEM. Um, and so I think the only way that we're going to be able to even start to meet that, that shortfall and that urgent need um, is by being a lot more um, diverse in, in our hiring and our training practices. Mm. Um, we, like most nations around the world, not all, but like most nations around the world, we have um, a, a gender gap, a quite stark gender gap in STEM in Australia. Um, but we also have a race gap. Mm. We are not culturally and linguistically diverse, despite being a multicultural nation, despite having uh, three to 4% of, of our population, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and we are also not traditionally terribly good at bringing people in uh, to STEM in mid-career. And I think those two, if, if we look at those two opportunities, there is a very rich potential um, STEM-skilled workforce to bring in um, and, and, and work with to problem solve. The extra benefit of taking this perspective is that we get all kinds of different approaches to problem solving. Yes. You know, we know that if we have a group of people who are from the same cultural background, the same gender, um, who perhaps have gone to the same sorts of schools and done the same sorts of degrees, that they're very likely to try and tackle a problem from the same perspective and with the same tools. Yes. But if we bring people in with cultural diversity, with different lived experience, um, with different ways of thinking, different life stages, different genders, um, I think that we exponentially superpower, our supercharge our capacity to problem solve. And so I think it's a very exciting opportunity. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the sh shortfall in the workforce, uh, for particularly for, for engineers, is, is not unique to Australia. So the UK and Europe uh, are experiencing the, the same shortfalls, but within that also there's the 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 challenge around diversity, lack of diversity, and that diversity being required to deliver an interdisciplinary, unique, different approach to tackling the you know, the sustainable development goals around. In the case of engineers, it, it's climate change, it's infrastructure, and there's been quite a bit of emphasis from UK uh, institutions, the Institute of Engineering Technology and the uh, Institute of Civil Engineers focusing on uh, people or human centred infrastructure where the the engineering to date has been very linear in terms of process because that lack of diversity and they're now looking to bring in social science, humanities, arts, uh, into in addition to other disciplines like architectural, obviously, but um, a real focus on trying to you know, build skills from you know, early career engineers in social sciences, humanities, and have an understanding that will help them take a more human people centered approach. So it's not unique to Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's crucial. And I think, you know, it, uh, it's, it's, really um, very challenging to see uh, that the, the weather effects of climate change and the extreme events that climate change uh, brings are starting to affect um, the Northern Hemisphere in ways that it hasn't happened previously. And, and I know in Europe that it's been a very challenging um, few years on that front as well. <laughs> In Australia, we've, we've had those extreme events for a little bit longer. We're a little bit of a, a climate canary, I think, in the coal mine. Um, and extreme bushfire, extreme flood, um, it's the new normal. 
very sadly, mm -hmm. it's the new normal, coastal mm -hmm. erosion. Um, and, and of course, heat waves um, are something that we've been contending with for a long time, but they're becoming more frequent and more intense. Um, and so um, when we talk about tackling climate change, yes, we need to uh, urgently affect a clean energy transformation, but we also need to think about how we build resilience in community. And I think that's where that interdisciplinary approach is, mm -hmm. um, is so crucial because we're talking about people. We're not just talking about theory or systems or structures. Um, and ultimately, all, all of that, and, um, I think, we, the more we can learn and the more um, different kind of ways of thinking that we bring into that and, and knowledges that we bring into that, um, that problem-solving approach, the stronger it becomes. I mean, we are incredibly fortunate in Australia to have amongst us the, the world's oldest continuous culture, 60,000 years and, and more, latest studies suggest, mm. um, of sustainable living in this incredibly harsh climate and country. It's a very old country. Our, our dirt is very poor. Um, it, it, yes. they, the conditions here are mm. really harsh. And, and having um, uh, the Aboriginal uh, nations across Australia having survived and thrived for so long in those conditions, there's clearly something to be learned there. And um, nobody here is suggesting we kind of go back to the old ways. That's impossible after 200 plus years of, um, of colonised Australia. Um, but, but a new way forward that brings those knowledge systems together and brings the best of both knowledge systems together in a respectful and, and um, mutually kind of a mutual partnership. I think mm. that could be really powerful. Similarly in the Pacific, you know, where, um, I mean, we talk about climate change canaries, the Pacific Island nations are, are really um, at the forefront of climate change um, in terms of its impact on societies. Um, and, mm. and so, Again, many sort of sustainable traditional knowledge systems are, I think, important to listen to while also thinking about how do they work in concert with the latest science and technology development. And we're starting to see some really interesting research being done on that front. But, um, but that's sort of, again, that's, we're talking about priorities. That's a, that's a huge priority for us as well. Um, because I think it's really important to remember that um, technology isn't an end in and of itself. Technology, yes. science, and, and their application, engineering, these are all in service of humanity. Mm. Mm. And uh, Kylie, when we talked in our briefing meeting, you mentioned the importance of data in supporting the goals around you know, uh, building diversity at a, a systemic level. Could you elaborate a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, I think we it's, it's, we don't know what we don't know, um, mm. and uh, there are historically a lot of assumptions built into the way that we collect data, the kinds of data that we collect, and how we analyse, interpret, and package, and, and respond to that data. So um, one example uh, that I came across a couple of years ago, um, the Australian government recently, I think five or six years ago, established a STEM equity monitor, which is an excellent and useful tool. And we need to know the information that they collect through that monitor. What it does is it looks at uh, what started out looking at gender equity, but it now has broadened out to look at all kinds of diversity data in the STEM workforce in Australia, looking at research, government, private sector, looking at seniority levels, looking at grant application success rates, um, looking at dropout points, um, and, and we know that uh, particularly for women um, and, uh, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, there are some very well-defined dropout points in a STEM career. Mm. And without that, I mean, that, it's not a solution. It's, it's an articulation of the problem, but it's, it's a, that's the first step. And we all knew that there was a problem, but we didn't know precisely what it looked like or where it lay. So this, this monitor is a really important tool. But we realised when we started drilling down on a couple of particular issues that um, the information that was being um, presented about grant, um, successful grant applications to the um, Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council um, was uh, a little bit um, misleading in that it, mm. it was saying, uh, it was saying, or doing a gender uh, breakdown which included any team that had a woman as part of the team and counting that as a successful grant application 
um, for a woman. Now, mm. we know that it's very different uh, when you look at a primary investigator compared with a, post a postdoc. So, um, so what we've asked and, and the research councils and the, um, the department that manages this monitor have absolutely and, and very quickly responded to is to have that data broken down further so that we now understand how many of those primary investigators are women versus men mm. rather than how many teams had a woman in them. Um, and yes. that's really important because um, one of the keys to changing or to improving equity is systemic change. And one of the really strong levers that you can use for systemic change is money. Mm -hmm. So changing mm -hmm. some grant funding rules in order to incentivize a more equitable approach to supporting the promotion of female researchers and women of, or people of color, um, that's a really simple lever, um, probably politically not so simple, but in terms of its application, a very simple lever that can be mm -hmm. pulled in order to make a step change in the system and the number of people who are coming through and being supported to, to progress in their careers. So it's really That's important. A... You see, the other sort of thing that I, I've been thinking about with regards to data um, is, uh, is data sovereignty for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, mm. And this sort of just starts to veer into the, the open source discussion um, as well, because um, historically, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia have not been, um, uh, they've not had agency in terms of their participation with research. Yes. Um, historically, there has been exploitative research um, done on and about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but not done with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So it's it's vitally important that um, that people are included uh, and have agency and have full understanding of what they're signing up to be part of, um, particularly mm. when you come to a peoples that has been exploited historically and marginalised historically, um, and and to you know th this it is complex, um, but it's really really important to do that. It, it means though that um, there are some challenges. I think, to, in Australia um, to uh, taking a, an open approach to making information available. Um, culture, for example, culturally, um, it is inappropriate to mention um, the names of deceased people in, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mm. cultures. Um, and so even something so simple as publishing a paper in which uh, an, interviewer, an interviewee has been um, identified, um, that, that's, that's fraught. Um, mm -hmm. a, another example is that if were to, uh, if, if you were to do um, collaborative research uh, with traditional knowledge holders, you'd be um, many times you'd be dealing with a community rather than an individual or an entity. And so IP becomes challenging in that situation. It's a new kind of an agreement. So, um, mm -hmm. so there, there's a lot of kind of um, very important but probably quite detailed and difficult work to be done in order to ensure that we have um, both ad addressed historical inequities and exploitative practices and built the foundations for a genuinely collaborative um, and equal partnership going forward. Mm -hmm. And I guess with, with open source, we could probably move to talking about op open science and open access publishing. And uh, Kat, your chief scientist, Cathy Foley, last year um, you know, issued a very, very strong statement, if not mandate, to for open science for Aus Australian research. Um, uh, how is Australia performing against that, um, that objective? Uh -huh. So the Chief Scientist has, has proposed an interesting approach. Um, she's proposed a, um, a national subscription, essentially, whereby the Australian government would negotiate and, and pay for um, subscriptions that would provide access through a single portal. Um, for Australians to access research, which is potentially a cheaper option and opens up more um, access to peer-reviewed research. I guess on the flip side of that, the challenge, is, as you and I have spoken about, is that um, the open source model requires the researcher to pay or, or their employer to pay um, to have their work published. And, um, and I think that's um, quite a challenging scenario in terms of equity mm. of access. Um, 
the big old institutions, the moneyed institutions, will never have a problem with this. Um, but do we really want to entrench a system that um, that keeps the newer um, research organisations or the independent researchers out essentially until they've they've attained um, financial security, which mm -hmm. you know is an elusive thing in research at the best of times. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. So I think there are some challenges to it. Um, I am in favour of open source. I think you know being able to look at the latest research from around the world at, at any time when undertaking your own work can only benefit um, and advance the body of knowledge that we have as a species. Um, and having access to raw data is really important and, and again, fast tracks some of the processes as well. It's much more efficient. Um, but then, look, going back to... Um, that sort of uh, that data sovereignty and the IP sovereignty question. Um, yes. I think there are some challenges there, um, and you know I know that um, as I said, uh, there are uh, quite a number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander groups in Australia, in particular, who have spent a lot of time and energy um, trying to uh, gain their rightful control of, of, of data about themselves and their own communities, and so opening things right up does risk that. Um, and obviously, also there's a commercial inconfidence risk, but I think that there are probably some some more simple and established solutions to addressing that one. So, um, yeah, I think we, we're still kind of working through as a nation how we want to tackle mm. this. And of course, like anything, we're not united because there are lots of different kinds of organisations and different kinds of people. But there is definitely momentum building towards um, towards an, an open source model of some kind. Yes. Uh, well, you know, uh, outside of Aust Australia and, you know, internationally, you know, uh, publishers and particularly commercial publishers now embraced open open access publishing as, as the new business model. But as we've discussed, it, it uh, maybe unintentionally introduces a financial barrier and a, a level of inequity at the, the individual researcher level where prior for subscription-based journals, there was no fee for publishing in the journal. So the, the inverted model has has still challenges that need to be worked out. And then the the challenges around data and having open and fair da data, data that's operable and accessible, um, but protecting intellectual property, protection, protecting cultural rights, which you, you very nicely uh, uh, communicated here for, um, Aboriginal and um, you know, just just to protect that, and you know, it extends to patient data as well. You know that so that oh. there's there's lots of work working groups dealing with those issues, wanting to advance open science, but wanting to also protect things that need still need to be protected. Um, yeah. So no model's ever going mm, to be perfect, though, is it? No. And and I think one of the things that um, that that I, I think a little bit about um, in this in the context of this discussion is that you know Australia spends we don't know exactly how much but somewhere before between 460 million and one billion dollars a year um, to publishers and uh, the total budget of the Australian Research Council is about 800 million a year so imagine how much more research could be done if we spent that money on uh, um, exactly on supporting that's... that instead. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Um, but yeah, again, that that needs to be worked out. Um, so uh, just just mentioning other organisations that are you know, similarly minded within Australia. How how do you coordinate? How do you work together? Uh, well, I guess it sort of depends on on the issue. But um, but we have, as I mentioned, we've got five learned academies in Australia, and we come together under the umbrella of the Australian Council of Learned Academies, a COLA. Um, and uh, where it makes sense for a, a, a genuinely kind of multidisciplinary approach to, say, a report or a submission or a public statement, um, we we absolutely work together through a COLA. Sometimes, um, you know, one on one as well, depending again, depending on the the topic at hand. We also have a, a range of different um, uh, peak bodies, I guess you would call them, um, as as exist anywhere. So, you know, places like Universities Australia, Science and Technology Australia, which represents all of the um, the associations and societies in um, in science and technology. 
Uh, we all tend to have people and presence in Canberra, the capital city, um, and mm. we all know each other. Australia is a fairly small pool. We don't actually mm. have a huge <laughs> population. So, um, it's not like we sort of walk down the street and say good day, but it's not far <laughs> off, I've got to say, particularly in Canberra. Um, we're we're yes. quite a small, a small city here. So mm -hmm. you do, and, and you know, we all frequent the same places uh, in terms of mm -hmm. Parliament House and the various departments. Um, so it's, it's a very friendly and collaborative sector here. Um, we, we have to be, um, mm. because otherwise we'd get nothing done. So, um, <laughs> but, but I also think that we are incredibly fortunate to have uh, in, across the sector and, you know, thinking about the, the learned academies and the peak bodies, we have an incredibly passionate group of, of leadership across those organisations, as we do in our public service, in fact. Um, and, you know, we, we work very closely with departmental leads and other senior policy makers as well. Mm -hmm. um, very collegiate, very collaborative. Um, and it doesn't mean we agree on everything, of course, but, but we're always pretty friendly about how we work things out. Mm. And maybe just thinking, uh outside of Australia internationally, how, how do you think uh, Australia, Australia's science and technology sector compares with other countries? There are other countries that you think are doing better, doing similar in terms of initiatives? I, I guess it depends on which aspect you're looking at, because, um, because I don't think you can sort of say doing better on, at science and technology um, as, as a big kind of picture statement. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we do, Australia does very, very well in terms of um, the publishing rate per capita. We're, um, we're very successful in that sense. Um, we are also really good at collaborating internationally because we have to be, um, because mm. we're small, because we are um, distant from most of the rest of the world geographically. Um, if we don't proactively collaborate, we get left behind. Um, and, uh, and I think in terms of uh, approaches to um, equity and diversity, um, we, we're doing okay. Uh, we're, we're probably um, nearer to the top than the bottom, but we certainly, um, I, I'd say that there are other uh, nations that are doing better at that. Um, I, I know, you know, we've, we've spoken about the Athena Swan model and certainly um, we mm. were very pleased to be able to borrow from that um, and establish our own sites and uh, science in Australia Gender Equity Organisation, SAGE, um, which is based on the, the Athena Swan model. But we're a little bit behind. We're about 10 years behind Athena Swan here. So we are not, not quite starting to see, I think, the full... Um, benefits of, of the results of that systemic reform that um, that, that model supports and encourages. Likewise, on um, on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or First Nations approaches um, in Canada, for example, there's been um, a lot of deep thinking about this and, and proactive action on this issue for a long time in terms of ensuring equitable access to STEM education and participation in the STEM skill workforce. Um, and we've um, been lucky enough to learn from some of our friends in Canada and um, are thinking about how we can better apply those lessons um, here in Australia. We've recently supported the um, establishment of the first national Indigenous STEM professionals network here in Australia. And I think that's mm -hmm. going to be an incredibly valuable tool to connect people um, because, as I'm sure you're aware, scientists and technologists or academics tend to kind of connect very well um, vertically within their own profession, their own discipline. But, um, but it's a lot more challenging to connect um, laterally across um, the various disciplines and across the sector, and particularly when you're also trying to connect across levels of seniority. So um, this network, amongst a number of other um, challenges that it's trying to address, mm -hmm. is first and foremost a connecting network so that people have got peers who they can uh, mentor, connect with, um, share experiences with. And I've, I've really seen firsthand the power of, of that, particularly for women in STEM, um, who mm. often, and, you know, when you think about IT and engineering, they're often the only woman in the room or in the school or in the research group or in the, the lab. So yes. um, having that network of peers has, and knowing that the, ch the challenges that you're facing are not unique to you, they're not about you, they are a systemic issue, um, you can read about it all you like, but having that personal experience, there's nothing to replace it. 
Um, mm-hmm. So, yes, we, we've got a few. Um, I think we're, in, in terms of, yeah, how does Australia do? I think we do pretty well on a number of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously mm-hmm. um, we are behind um, when it comes to those um, aspects of a, a healthily functioning STEM sector and, and ecosystem that rely mm-hmm. on critical mass. Yes. We don't have the population. We don't have borders with other nations. Um, we, in terms of the quantum of funding that goes to our research, uh, absolutely it needs to be higher. Um, mm. Not just in terms of absolutes, but in terms of a percentage of GDP as well. So there mm. are things that we can do better on. The other thing that we're not so good at in Australia is systemically and culturally supporting translation of research. Mm-hmm. And we have a lot to learn um, internationally on that front. But it's also one of the reasons why we're very good at collaborating internationally because. Um, often researchers, when they've got a, a really great piece of um, high potential uh, um, uh, pe- work to apply or to commercialise, they won't find the investment that they need in Australia. Mm. Um, oftentimes, mm. they'll, they'll have to seek that internationally. So that collaboration is a necessity. Mm. Thank you. I did want I did want to mention that you you you'd led the establishment of the superstars of STEM, which is world renowned. So that's something that has certainly over the past years come across my desk and colleagues' desks. So, you know, that that's you know, obviously something to be very, very proud of. I'm very hear it described as world-renowned. That's excellent. <laughs> I, of course, I don't <laughs> run it anymore. I did establish it um, when I was um, working at a different organisation, but um, the Excellent yeah. Science and Technology Australia and, and their CEO, Misha Schubert, do a fantastic job with that programme. Yeah, I, uh, in the UK, uh, the UK still ran a STEM ambassador program. So I was uh, a STEM ambassador program uh, um, uh, ambassador for uh, for a few years. And uh, yeah, certainly Australia was mentioned and Superstars of STEM was mentioned. So we went to my, when I went to my daughter's school to give a, uh, a lecture to the whole school, which was slightly unnerving. Um, uh, you did feature on a on a slide, so uh, which makes it really nice to meet to now meet you um, and have you on the podcast. So uh, that has been great. Uh, we we time is against us, Kylie, uh, and um, again, I'm, I'm so appreciative of your time today. It's been great great conversation, and perhaps maybe we you could leave us with uh, maybe a view on. Uh, Australian science and technology initiatives that are coming up and what we should look out for in the next year or so? Yeah, well, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening. Um, We have a really strong, fresh focus. We've got a new government here. Uh, Well, relatively new still, you may have heard. Um, Mm -hmm. And the good news is that they are um, very uh, cognizant of the benefits of investing in and supporting great science and technology, which makes us very happy. Um, and there's a focus on uh, quantum computing. Um, our fellow Michelle Simmons is um, absolutely recognised globally as a leader in quantum computing. So that mm. um, that's something that's been very vigorously supported to advance in Australia. And I think some exciting things coming out there um, at the moment and, and in the near future as well. Um, artificial intelligence and robotics are also really strong focus areas for us. And, um, you know, robotics can do all kinds of things, but uh, I had a lot of fun um, looking at uh, recently at some of the work that's being done in robotics in agriculture, um, and those the uh, the ability to um, discern between a ripe tomato and an unripe tomato, and then pick it so very very gently, is um, amazing. Is quite something to see. Now I know that's a very simple kind of robot, but mm. gee, it's mm. it's a lovely thing to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously robotics in surgery and medical applications um, and in military applications is um, incredibly complex and, um, and holds a lot of um, interesting innovation promise. Of course, it's the energy transformation as well, Martin. Um, yes. Because, you know, we, mm. it, it is such an urgent priority um, and Australia has uh, some natural assets that make us really well placed as well as the research clout. Um, mm. we, we are and we should be leaders in solar power, um, given our abundant sunshine and vast spaces. Mm. Um, mm. We're also doing really important research um, in uh, the hydrogen power um, economy 
um, and all of the technology that underpins that. And, uh, you know, I visited our first hydrogen station, a refuel station in Melbourne a couple of years ago. Um, I know we're looking at um, storage and, and freight solutions for that too. We've mm -hmm. got extraordinary, exciting work coming up in battery storage technology as well. Um, and still looking at sort of, you know, uh, new approaches to wind power and other things like tidal power, of course. Um, actually, just I saw just this morning that um, four Australian solar technology pioneers have been um, awarded the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering for their work to develop um, incredibly efficient solar cells. So mm. there really is some very exciting work going on here, um, as there should be, um, mm -hmm. I think, in, in energy transformation technologies. That's great. Uh, thank you, Kylie, so much for, for sharing your insights and your, your journey to where you are now and what what uh, the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering is is doing in terms of priorities and, and more, more generally, you know, good news around new initiatives like, you know, what we've just been talking about here. So thank you again for your time. I uh, appreciate it. I'll make sure I'll include links to your references in the podcast when it's published. And um, what we might do is, is grab another 45 minutes of your time in a year's time and see how things have progressed. But for the moment, Kylie, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I've, I've been delighted to meet up again and thank you very much, Martin.